guys, Allison here, the Board Housewife. Um, I am so excited for this week's episode. So I know I usually say that every week, but I am actually like super excited. Um, I know you guys have heard me in the last few weeks like asking for ideas. What do you guys want to hear? Um, and it's not that I can't come up with ideas because I can come up with a million things to talk about any day of the week. Um, I just want what I am talking about to have value and to be relatable and to add something to somebody's life that's, you know, maybe a little bit different than what's out there. So after a lot of different things that have been going on, I finally have found what I've been searching for. Um, my mom gave me this book that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes and it kind of brought everything to like fruition of like what I've been searching and trying to bring to this world that I've created. Um, so I'm going to say this word and I beg you, please do not turn off your YouTube. Please do not turn off your Apple podcast or Spotify or whatever you're watching or listening this on. Um, because it's important and I promise I will make it as entertaining as possible and it will be entertaining. I'm going to shed a new light on this word. Okay, the word is philosophy. <laughs> so I think now more than ever we need some new philosophers in this world and I'm sure there are people out there that like claim to be philosophers or are philosophers or whatever. Um, they write about it and study it. Um, maybe they have their own ideas that they're writing. I don't really know many of them. Um, I think most people, when they think of philosophy, they think about a whole bunch of old dead Greek guys like Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. Um, I will talk a little bit about Plato slash Socrates, um, but I'm not going to get heavy with it. The whole point of me wanting to do this is I'm realizing that like there's all this advice out in the world. There's all these people telling us what to do, how to be better, all this. And I find it really hard to stick to these advice. Like at first you get like really inspired and then it's just like, ah, you know, I can't like keep doing this or it's too like, it's just not, it's just not the answer. And what I've realized, philosophy is the answer because philosophy is actually a way of exploring life. It's about exploring ideas. It's about being open-minded. Um, I will tell you there are things that I have read that are like self-help books that have not stuck with me at all. I'm sure at the time I, I was inspired and like, you know, try to practice some of their like ideas. But I will tell you some of the stuff that I've learned through philosophical readings um, have stayed with me for life. And when I'm in these pits, when I'm in, you know, a bad place, my mind thinks back on these things that I've read or these things that I've learned through philosophy. Um, and then also through my own ideas. So I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to call myself a modern day philosopher. If you don't think I am, that's totally fine. It's not going to hurt my, my feelings. But as I'm going to get into this episode, I'm going to share all these new ideas with you guys is a little bit longer, so please have a drink or two drinks ready um, because we are going to get into some shit, and I promise I will make it fun, guys. This is not going to be your boring ancient Greek philosophy class, okay? This is Allison, the Bored Housewife class, and we are going to have so much fucking fun. Um, so, yeah. Grab your mint julep or whatever your beverage of choice is. Um, Lady Eccentric is going to be with us in just a moment. Um, and cheers, guys. Let's have some fun. And, and hello, my sweets. I am so excited to be back for another episode of The Board Housewife. Uh, so this week's episode...
episode is um, featuring the mint julep cocktail. And I've got to say, it really brings me back. And I'm going to get to that story in just one moment. So the mint julep. There's different ways to make this drink, but Allison did a very straightforward, uh, you know, easy cocktail so that it's just about the bourbon with a little bit of a minty flavor and it's delicious. So, first you, if you watched the tutorial, then you don't need me to explain it again, but in case you didn't, first you take the mint and you put a little simple syrup in your shaker. Uh, no ice yet, and you just muddle that baby up. So that way, you get the flavors of the mint and a little bit of a sweetness for the bourbon. And then you put in the ice in the shaker. We put in three shots, which I think is uh, seven and a half ounces of bourbon. Pretty boozy, but Allison is a woman after my own heart, and we both love booze. So. Um, yeah, so then you put in the three shots of bourbon, your choice. We used Bodstown bourbon this week. Um, and then you serve it over ice. And it's just such a nice, refreshing summer sipper that um, I think you all are going to enjoy. So, men juleps, right? Ah, to be young again is all I have to say. So, I was working on my first movie. Um, very first movie, uh, this was back in the day when they didn't have any uh, microphones, if you get my point. Sound hadn't been invented with the cinema yet. Anyways, so um, I'm working on this movie and I get in, in New York City, um, out in Queens. Um, and I get invited to this big fancy snatchy party out on Long Island. Now, I've never been to Long Island before. I was, uh, you know, just a kid, starry-eyed, brand new to the biz. Um, so getting invited to this party was like a pretty big deal, right? So I go out, and it's a huge mansion. And there are all these, you know, stunning people with money, and champagne is everywhere. And, you know, it was just crazy. It was literally the Roaring Twenties. And I was just, you know, really out of my element. So I'm sitting there, and this nice young man comes up and starts talking to me. Now, he was a gentleman. And uh, I think he was from somewhere in England. And I will just say... He was the prince. And I'm not going to name any names because I promised him I would never tell. Uh, but he was a prince. At the time, I didn't know it. I just thought he was so handsome and so sweet and so nice to talk to little old me. Because like I said, I was not lady eccentric at this point. I was just a little bitty nobody. So we get talking and we're having a great time. We both shared a mint julep that night. It was wonderful. So he asked if he could call on me. And I was like, of course you can, dear. So um, after that, we started seeing each other regularly. We would go for walks in Central Park. Um, sometimes we would go out to this party again together. He would take me to these lavish dinners. It was wonderful. The problem is, he was a prince, but he was a prince undercover. So he wasn't sure if he wanted the life of royalty anymore. And um, he had left without telling anybody, and he was all here in secret. He had a few friends in America and in New York City that were kind of helping him out. But sure enough, his parents found him, and they told him he had to come home. So or else all of his fortunes would be gone and he would be disowned. And, you know, he didn't want that. He loved his family, whatever. So uh, I was heartbroken nonetheless. Um, the last night we had together, we were out on Long Island again, and we were at this party, but there was this little grassy knoll area kind of down by the water, and uh, there were so many stars in the sky. Back then, they didn't have as many lights as they have now, so you could actually still see the sky. Um, anyways, so we were drinking mint juleps, saying our goodbyes, and I asked if I could be a princess, and he told me no. So that was kind of devastating. But, you know, it was fun to uh, know and have dated a prince for a moment, and he was such a gentleman, 
and um, then I had to just go on about my way. Now, I became Lady Eccentric, he became the king of wherever. Um, you know, sometimes life just happens a little differently for all of us, but every time I have a mint julep now, I think of him and his sweet little face. And, um, you know, I wished him well overall. I understand, you know, I'm not anything fancy. I mean, I come from the Midwest. I mean, what are they going to, you know, make me a princess? I mean, come on. I didn't want that lifestyle anyways. I wanted the lifestyle of Lady Eccentric. I got it. And here we are today. So, cheers. Sip on your mint julep with your closest honey. Make it last. We only live once, right? Cheers, my sweets. Back to you, Allison. I hope you have a great episode. Cheers, Lady Eccentric. Aww, cheers, my sweet. Thank you so much for doing the cocktail tutorial again. I think people really Aww, enjoy thank you. Thank you, my sweet. Yes. Of course. I know. I know. Me. Who wouldn't love you? All right. So, I'm going to get to the podcast enjoy. now. Enjoy. <laughs> okay. So, I have notes this week, guys. Um... Here's the deal. <laughs> I'm going to say some things, and it's not very nice. I have, it's not that it's not nice. I'm just being honest. And some people take honesty as if it's like you're being mean, and I'm not being mean. Um, this is my opinion. For the first time on the show, I am having a serious opinion about something. Um, people might disagree with my opinion, and that's totally fine. I just want you to take what I say in this episode and the first thing I want for you to do is just really think about the things that I'm saying, the things that I'm talking about and think about it in your own life and the things that you've tried, the things that you failed at, maybe why they failed, um, things that inspired you but then you lost inspiration. Like I just want you to think about these sorts of things and then think about what I'm telling you. The second thing is, um, I'm going to probably sound like a hypocrite, but I promise you I'm not. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you I'm not giving advice, and then it's going to sound like I'm giving advice. I am not giving advice. I am giving my personal opinion on the outlook of things, and I'm giving a very serious opinion of why I think you should definitely reconsider the things that we look at. And and not that you can't enjoy these things still, but that you should look at them in a different way and appreciate them in a different way. So that is my disclaimer, okay? <laughs> Cheers. Let's get started. <laughs> so my mother told me to read this book. It's called Girl, Wash Your Face by Rachel Hollis. Okay, this is a number one New York Times bestseller book for advice for women on how to live a better life, how to achieve your dreams. How many times have you guys picked up a book or looked on Instagram or watched a movie, went to a seminar, thought about getting a life coach, got a life coach? Um, how many times have you guys done this and thought that these people were going to solve all your problems and that you would get off your ass and overnight become successful. Yeah, I've done that I don't know how many fucking times and I'm annoyed with it and I'm tired of it. And this is why. Because what these people tell you are fucking lies, okay? Sure, she has some really cute stuff to talk in here, talk about in here. She has funny anecdotes, um, embarrassing anecdotes. I mean, whatever, to each his own. I don't know how peeing your pants on a trampoline has anything to do with finding happiness in your life, but apparently it does. So um, it's kind of all over the place. I'm only halfway through the book. Um, and yeah, I guess her overall thing here is that <clears throat> we tell ourselves lies and these lies hold us back from achieving our dreams. Okay, cool Rachel Hollis. Um, your book's cute, but it doesn't do anything for me. And this is why. This is, and I'm telling you, and this is why I'm, you're going to be like, you're a hypocrite, Allison. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. <clears throat> what these people do 
in these books is they give you these steps and they say, you know, don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, no, it's just, you know, just uh, exit, you know, or you got to find another way around it. Like the books are full of cliches. If it sounds like a cliche, if you've heard it before, it's a cliche. Um, how they continue to make money off of this shit and how they continue to rebrand the same cliches over and over and over again blows my mind. Um, just organizing your life. Like, if you can't, like, if you are someone who struggles with, like, organization or something, sure, hire someone to help you get organized. But, like, you have to really believe that you're going to implement these ideas. And so this is the thing. This is the big secret that nobody says. These people, okay, have figured out how to overcome the resistance. So the resistance is something that I got from this other book called The War of Art. So I'm going to be using examples from books that I actually feel are good and that are um, useful that are to the point that actually say something and aren't just fun, like full of funny anecdotes and stories that like I guess are relatable sometimes. Am I relatable? Do I share my stories? Yes. But am I actually on here? Try and this is where I'm like, people are gonna think I'm a hypocrite. I'm not. I tell my stories to have fun. I'm telling you this stuff today to be a little bit more serious. But the stuff that I talk about, it's just to talk about, it's just to throw out an idea, right? I'm not telling you how to be me. These people are trying to tell you how to be them, how they got their success. The only reason why they have their success is because they overcame the resistance. The resistance is that thing inside of you that tells you, no, you can't do it. I don't want to do it today. It's too hard. I want to be lazy. And that is the single thing that these people have figured out how to overcome. How you overcome that, I don't know. I don't know. How these people have dedicated themselves to that, I really don't know how you get to that point. And that's the thing that nobody wants to tell you. Because you don't sell books telling people, I don't know. So I'm going to read a little bit of a passage from this. Um, he says, and this is kind of explains the resistance. Again, that thing that is inside of you that tells you, no, like I can't do this. Um, I shouldn't do this. Uh, I'll be embarrassed if I do this, whatever it is. The more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we feel toward pursuing that. So how many of you guys have felt like that there's something that you want to do whether it's creative or just to better your life and it's scary because it's an unknown scenario but it feels like you can feel it inside of you that this is what I need to do well we don't live in an easy society so you have to figure out how to overcome that these people have figured out how to overcome that they've decided that Regardless of how scary it is, how hard it is, whatever, they're going to do it. So another thing that he says in The War of Art is to act like a Marine. And I love this example because then it's going to bring me into my next point. Um, to act like a Marine is basically, and I think it's fun because my husband's a Marine, um, you know, you get trained in, a, in, in something and... You just do it for, for the sake of doing it. You are, you attack it. You are trained in everything to do this. So, so many of us, we don't think that way because maybe we don't think we're as qualified or whatever. My feeling on it is, is this. I've said to my husband several times that I'm kind of jealous of him being a Marine. And the reason why is because he has such a bigger purpose to his job, and that is the protection of our country, like fighting for something that is so huge and so 
beautiful and just perfect. And everything that we have in this country, there it's nothing like there's nothing else like it in the world, right? So when I see my husband and his dedication to the Marine Corps and his friends and all of that, I just kind of get a little jealous because I'm like, I don't have that to anything. I don't have this innate feeling of like, and I think even it was like Chesty Polar or something they have in, um, in San Diego at least, they have the quote that like, no Marine regrets their decision because it's like they know that, and that's not the quote, I should probably look it up, <laughs> but it's like they just never feel like they never did anything with their lives because they were Marines. And I think, you know, that could go for anybody who's served in the military. Um, but it's like these people that are on your so- social media, that are selling the self-help books that are pretending to, or that are life coaches. Um, I'm not trying to put you down because I think those people are really inspirational and it's important that we have inspiration in our world. Um, Inspiration comes to us and drives us in that moment and it can come in life or death scenarios. It can come in breaking points. It can come in so many ways and I think that those signs or maybe even literal signs are really important. But inspiration doesn't keep you going because I hate the term and I've and I've used it so many times and I loathe it now. Robot mode, like issue robot mode into whatever it is that you want to do. If you're not liking doing something, and let's just take working out because everyone has had their love hate with that scenario, right? If you hate working out, initiating robot mode is only going to work for so long. You cannot initiate robot mode for your entire life. And you might say to me, oh, but Allison, like I do and I'm this or that. No, you found a bigger purpose in working out in a life fulfillment and how it fulfills your every day. That's not robot mode. Um, Robot mode is when I hate working out, I don't want to work out and I'm forcing myself to do this. You cannot do that your whole life. And that is a very strong opinion, but I'm being serious. And go ahead. Anybody can tell me different. But these people, they're not the ones that are successful. The ones that are telling you what they did to be successful, they are not initiating robot mode. If you're watching a fitness expert or something and they're trying to tell you this, no, they're not initiating robot mode either. They may think they are, but their greater purpose, their job, their life is dedicated to fitness. And that's the difference. So they can initiate robot mode because it's like they know that they have to do this to be successful at their job. And the reality of it is you don't have to be a size two or a size zero or whatever to be a fitness coach. And I'm going to get in that in another episode shortly. Um, I have had an epiphany. I've had a revolution (laughs) in the way that I think about fitness and nutrition and health. Um, and it's all a bunch of bullshit and I've already been mad at the beauty and industry already, but that's another day. So what I'm trying to say is the people that are successful, the people that do these things, they live for it. You're not an athlete and not live for that sport. You're not an artist and not live for painting. You're not a writer and live for writing. You're not uh, whatever and live for that. The reason why they're that person, the reason why they're at the top is because that they found their purpose in this world. They found what that is and it's not a chore to them. They're eager to do it. So if you're sitting there thinking to yourself and you're like, man, I wish I could like, you know, just work out every day. Why can't I do that? Why can't I eat healthy every day? Or why can't I do X, Y, Z? The reason why is because it's not your purpose and you have to find something different. If you want to be physically fit and all of that, then you have to figure out what that is for you and how to keep you dedicated to it. And there's no secret to doing that. You just have to look inward. Maybe therapy would work. I am a huge, huge champion 
of going to therapy. I don't think enough people do it. I think I should probably do it. Um, because here's the thing. Talking to somebody or just looking on Instagram or trying to find a self-help book is only going to get you so far. These people don't know you personally. When you do something one-on-one with someone, with a therapist, they are able to not only have the expertise to understand what's going on in your life, but also evaluate you based on you. So if you're reading Girl, Wash Your Face because you're depressed and you don't know how to get off the fucking couch every day, um, or even if you're not depressed, you're just like, man, you know, I don't know how to get started. Go talk to somebody or go seek another expert in like the area that you want to start. But as far as like getting motivation and doing all of that, you have to look really closely at what it is that you want to do and you have to be able to overcome all of the obstacles. You have to look at the whole picture and decide, yes, this is important to me. Sacrificing these things are important to me or how can I incorporate them? How can I divvy out my time? How can I do all of this? Um... Because I think if you're a person who wants to do it all, you can definitely do it all. Um, But if you're a person who likes their downtime and all of that, like I am, (laughs) you have to make choices. So yeah, I'm going to stop there and we'll be right back. (laughs) Okay, so we're going to get back to the whole meaning of life thing because it's important, but I have some other examples to talk to you and other ideas to give you. I just don't want it to get too heavy because I want people to like this and stay with me. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the social media, the self-help, specifically this woman, Rachel Hollis. I'm not calling her out like she's a bad person by any means. I didn't care for her book. Um... She's an, she's an okay writer. Um, I, I guess, like, to me, like, having funny, like, modern sayings, like, hey, girl, hey, and, like, you know, okay, like, fun. Like, in a book, it feels weird when I'm, like, reading that. I don't know. It's just not my cup of tea, I guess. But, um, you know, she's somewhat entertaining, but it's, like, she has a lifestyle blog, So I don't know who decided that because you are a lifestyle blogger, you're all of a sudden like um, qualified to like give life advice and tell people like what to do. Um, She says in her book that people have like reached out to her like, oh, you know, I just don't know how you do it all. So she makes this huge point to be like, I'm not perfect. I'm the biggest mess that you've ever seen. So here we go. (laughs) First of all, I am going to be completely honest with you. If you follow me on social media, if you like any of my stuff, I am curating this shit just to look cool, okay? Do I make a fool of myself sometimes? Sure, because that's what people do on social media. I am not showing you intimate moments of my life. Do I care, honestly, about how great I look or whatever? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. Depends on the day, to be honest. If I'm tired and exhausted, but I know that I need to get shit out there. I don't care. I'll just do it. Um, Even today, I was trying to go for like this curly look in my hair and there's just not enough humidity in the atmosphere. So it fell a little flat. Whatever. It didn't work out the way that I wanted to. Does that mean I'm so real? No. If I was so real, I would have a bun in my head in my hair with sweatpants on and a giant t-shirt that I've worn for like three days in a row. Am I still telling you this to make you feel relatable to me? Absolutely not. You know why? Because that's not what all this is about. Social media is not actually about being relatable. Social media in books and television shows and everything that you absorb is about a very curated idea of what people think you want to see. So if I'm a lifestyle blogger like Rachel Hollis, and I'm putting out recipes, how to clean stuff, um other ideas I don't know what else she does but how like how she does her hair like I don't know like all that stuff that us women enjoy and like to get tips on do you want to see and think about this do you want to see pictures and shit that are sloppy and poorly lit and not put together very well or do you want to see the ideal version of what you think she is 
probably the second choice, right? And this is why. We don't go to social media. We don't watch movies. We don't read shit to remind us of the world that we live in. We go to these scenarios to escape ourselves. And it's fun when we can find relatable aspects to it because it makes you not feel so alone. Um, You know, there's other people going through this too. Um, Oh, I didn't think about that idea. And that's really cool when those moments happen and when you can combine some relatable aspects with the curated version, it inspires people. And this is what I'm talking about. This shit is for inspiration. This shit is to... Um, motivate people in that moment um, to make people feel good about themselves for that you know few seconds Um, this shit is not to last long half of you are going to watch this episode and you might not even remember it next week Um, you might see a funny video that you laugh at that I posted on social media are you going to remember a month from now probably not it gave you joy in that moment And that's awesome. And that's why we do this. That's why anyone on social media does this. Plus, they want fame or whatever. But even if you're a movie star or a writer or whatever you are, you're doing it for the moment. And for some people, if it sticks, that's really cool. Like, you might think of your favorite movie or something and really like a scene. scene. Um, Okay, cool. But long-lasting things in entertainment value, and I think social media is the same as in entertainment, um, they're fleeting. Those moments are fleeting. And that's opinion. (laughs) So that is my opinion. You might think differently. Um, You might go to the same person on a regular basis. I do. I see people on social media, and I look at their pages almost daily. I look at them for inspiration. That's it. Or to feel something. That's it. Or to be entertained. That's it. They're not actually changing my life. And that's the difference. And that's something that we need to think about. So when you have someone who has a lifestyle blog and all of a sudden they're becoming a self-help or a life coach or something, what do they actually, what actually qualifies them to do that? Because they can like make a good casserole. They have, they have the, I don't know, the level to be able to tell people how to live their lives. Like, no. So, sorry. I'm, I will spin out of control. (laughs) This is why I think it's taken me so much time to figure out what this is going to be about. Because when I start talking philosophy, I start talking in circles. And I think that's why people are afraid of it. Um, And I think that I'm trying not to make people afraid of philosophy. (laughs) So I need to slow down. Um, Anyways, so point is, people on social media are there to curate and take you out of your element. Maybe give an I give you a cool idea for something, um, but to tell you how to like achieve your dreams, no. Once again, the only way you can achieve your dreams if you have like this huge idea is to overcome what I call from the war of art, the resistance, and go into marine mode, find your bigger purpose, and dedicate yourself to that. And that is when you can achieve your dreams. How you do that, I don't think anyone can say. I don't think there's any one person. You can do all of the tips and tricks in the book. Um, It is not going to get you. You can be the most organized person ever. It is not going to get you there. You have to just decide that's what you're doing and stick to it. And that's hard to admit. That's hard for people to admit because, again, that doesn't sell books. That doesn't sell shit on social media. Um, Going back again still to social media, I have this theory and it's kind of out there. (laughs) So our society, I think, we have these certain rules that we live by. And there's this philosopher called John Locke. Um, He is 
was very important during the Enlightenment period, um, during the French Renaissance. A lot of his ideas were incorporated from the Founding Fathers and um, were part of uh, the thought process behind the Constitution of the United States. So if you're interested in that, go look it up. History is important and it's interesting if you're into that shit. Um, if you're not, whatever. Um, but anyways, um, John Locke <laughs> had this idea of natural uh, law. So these are rules that we live by, and this is why I'm bringing up, because rules like don't murder people, um, don't steal things, um, somebody's property is there. It's the pursuit of life, liberty, and property is originally what it was. So those are enacted, right? Those are natural law. Having those natural laws allow people's freedom. So I'm not going to get into all of it, but the reason why you have to have these things in order for people to be free is think about it. If you could just murder whoever you wanted, would we all be free people? We wouldn't, right? If you could just steal, if you could just walk into somebody's house and say, this is my house now, um, that wouldn't allow for much freedom. So you have to have certain like inalienable rights um, in order to have a free society. So, okay, great. Constitution's created. Now we have this free, we have these rules. Everything else, do what you want, right? <clears throat> However, over time and how society has been influenced, whether it's like through religion, pop culture, whatever it is, I feel like we have all of these unwritten rules that we quietly abide by. They're not necessarily spoken. And an example I want to give, if you guys watch Seinfeld, if you don't, then just bear with me. Um, there's this episode of Seinfeld where the whole gang, um, George, Jerry, Elaine, and Kramer are invited to a dinner party. And so they're all going, and Elaine's like, oh, we need to stop and get dessert. And so, or like a bottle of wine. She says one first, and then she was like, well, since there's so many of us, we should get two, two things. We should get a dessert and a bottle of wine. So George is so perplexed by this. He's like, they invited us to the party. Why do we have to bring anything? And Elaine's just like, it's just what you do. It's nice. And it's rude to not bring anything. And George just can't put his head around it. So then George is like, fine, then let's bring Pepsi and ring dings or some like, you know, silly, like little Debbie's sort of um, dessert. And Elaine's like, you don't bring ring dings and Pepsi to an adult party. And George is like, well, I like Pepsi. That's what I want to drink. And nobody ever has Pepsi at the parties. So they get in this whole thing, right? Um, Elaine is so adamant about a bottle of wine and like a babka, a chocolate babka. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever that's the story they get the wine and the babka what I find so interesting about that is in that scenario George is kind of right if somebody invites you to a party to their home we have this underlying obligation in society that I have to bring something and it's like why should you have to bring something why do we have and this is just one, one of those rules why is there this unwritten rule? Oh, because it's nice. Okay, so fine, whatever. Over time, more it feels like more and more of these rules are written. Um, and I think with the invention of social media, we have a window into these curated uh, lives of people, and it just creates more and more rules. So you have, like, you know, you can't just have a baby anymore. <laughs> you have to have the pictures in a funny way saying or an interesting way, cute way, curated way, showing that you're having a kid. Then you have the gender reveal, reveal parties. Then you have the afterbirth photos. And if that's rewarding and fun for you, by all means, do it. I am not looking poorly on any of this. Um, I'm just using it as an example because it's not just enough to be like, hey, we're pregnant, to the people that actually care about you being pregnant. Um, it's like, you know, you have to go through all these hoops to do all these things. 
And I noticed that some people even get pissed. Like, if you don't post your shit on social media and, like, a friend find like, why didn't I know you were pregnant? Like, oh, I don't know. Like, we don't talk ever. <laughs> it's, like, weird. So my point is, is, like, we've, we have all these under things and it's about, like, one-upping each other. And it's kind of, like, another example would be, like, if you vote, um, it's not enough to just go and vote anymore. You got to vote and then you got to put the sticker on and then you got to take a selfie. And I'm guilty of this. I've fucking done it, guys. I have. Go look back at my social media. <laughs> I have done this exact thing. But I realize how silly it is because it's almost like if you don't post a selfie with your I voted sticker, like you didn't vote. And it's like, I think some people really kind of feel like that. Um, so... Anyways, I just feel like our society is continuing to have all these like unwritten rules and obligations and expectations for people. And it's like, can we just stop? Like all of this is not serving us any purposes at all. And I'm going to get to that in one second. (laughs) Thank goodness for the mint julep tonight because I'm doing so much talking. I hope you guys are hanging in there with me. (laughs) Okay, so what I'm getting at with these little rules that we're creating for ourselves. Um, I think that they're holding us back. So the more of these unwritten, like quiet little societal things that we abide by, I think that's actually holding people back. So when you look at somebody's um, Instagram, so we'll just take mine for example. Someone might look at my social media. They might look at this podcast me sitting here talking about how hard it is to make all of this, um, is it really relatable? And I will still say it. I don't care because I'm not trying to necessarily inspire people to do anything. Um, I do want to be relatable on some level, but my point is this, like, is, like, Is hearing that it's hard actually going to help somebody else who's in the process or considering making a podcast? So if I talk about all these things and I'm thinking of it and I'm projecting it as, oh, you know, if I did it, you can do it too sort of thing. um, Is it that helpful? And I believe that it's not because I'm putting myself out there Um, I've put out this curated version and I'm sitting here and it's just like the Rachel Hollis thing. Like she's claiming that she's a mess, but then she does all of this shit. So are you really a mess? Because saying that you're something is objective to yourself. I can say this is really hard and it's frustrating, but you know what? I have a film background and I've worked on television shows and I'm a performer in like as when I was a dancer. For me, it's hard in my little world for somebody who's never fucking touched a camera, for somebody who's never performed in someone before, for somebody who's maybe like underprivileged in other ways, like this seems impossible. Me saying that it's hard only makes it harder for someone else to do it. So I think it's really weird that people who are trying to be inspirational try to um, relate in this way of, oh, you know, I'm a mess too. Wow, Rachel Hollis, you're a fucking mess and you still do all of these things? (laughs) Like, what the fuck am I? What the fuck am I? You know what I mean? And so that's one of those things where it's just like, we have all this shit out there and we have these rules and we have these people playing into these little like word games and shit and it's like none of this is helping anybody social media is fun social media can be inspirational social media can be whatever it is that you need it to be to you if you're somebody who shares on social media share away share your vacations share your gender reveals Share whatever the fuck you want because you know what? People like looking at that shit because it takes us out of the moment. We're on our phones all the time because we want to be taken away from our reality. It's cool when we see something 
that is somewhat relatable because then it comes back into us and we're like, oh yeah, I can understand that from this perspective. It might lead us to think about something different, but to actually use social media to be like, oh, I did it, you can too. Fuck that shit, guys. It's not real. And everyone keeps trying to say like, oh, you know, fuck that, I'm real, fuck the shit, fuck that. You know, everyone's like all about that, you know, like I don't care about what people think. But it's like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because you need people to care about what you think. You need people to enjoy your content. You need people to do all these things. So, you know what I'm saying here? We have all these rules. We're creating more and more rules. So now I'm going to get to the second part of the rules. What if, and if you guys are totally lost, I'm sorry. (laughs) The next episode will be more easily digested, I promise. Um... The next part that I'm going to get into about my rules theory is what if we got rid of these rules, okay? So I'm going to give this example, and it's based on my own scenario. I have a really hard time focusing on getting these things done, even though I really enjoy them. I've sat down and I've thought about it, and I'm like, Do you actually like doing this? Yeah, I do. I really like making this. I love sharing my ideas with you guys. I love talking and people responding. Like, it's so much fun to me. I love the interaction. I think it's so cool. But I have a really hard time. And like I said before, I value my downtime a lot. Um, I think... I'm not sure where it comes from. We could get into that whole thing. I Well, I kind of have an idea, but anyways, it's a lot. Um, so I really value my downtime. So there's a lot of times where I get overwhelmed when I'm thinking about making these, and I'm like, oh, I just want to sit down and watch TV. And I fight myself on it. I say, no, you can't watch TV. You have so much shit to do, Allison. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm watching TV. I'm watching TV. And it's just this back and forth. And I sit there and I feel guilty about watching the TV. But I sit there for hours watching some stupid reruns that I've already seen a million times over. Okay? So then I finally said, fine. Fine, bitch. Watch TV. Unapologetically guilt-free, watch TV, let's just try it out. And I did. You know what? I didn't even get through a full half-hour episode before I was up doing something because I don't actually want to watch TV. I'm just using it as a distraction from other things that I actually need to do. But by giving myself permission to watch the television, to do what it is that I wanted to do, read the book, whatever it is, that I wanted to do, even though in my head, I'm like, you're a lazy piece of shit, you need to be working harder, all these other people, like all of the things, right guys? I threw it out. I like, I really threw it out. I was like, you know what? No, I don't give a shit. I will sit here. I, I don't give a shit about my podcast. I will I can get, I'm not even, I'm not making any money from it. This is my brain, guys. But for real, I'm like, I am being very real. Like, I was just like, just fuck it. Nobody's paying you to do this. You have you have friends who look at it, and I know you guys that look at it like it, um, and, I, and I appreciate you all for it, but fuck it. Who cares, Allison? Who cares? What does it matter? Watch your fucking television show. And I did. And I literally sat there for maybe 15 minutes tops. And I was like, I have other shit to do. And I didn't want to watch TV anymore. So this is my point. That's the example. What if you gave in? Like, and, you know, it's got to be, you know, not things that are horrible for you. Like, if you're a drug addict, you're like, yeah, Allison said, go, go, so, so go, pain. <laughs> Go live your life. No, I'm not talking about that. Simple things, guys. Stuff that's not going to ruin your life. If you just take a moment and just give yourself full permission to do these things, what would your life look like? What would that scenario look like? Because we put so much stock in this. And you know what? If you do sit there for hours watching television, maybe you just need a break. 
Maybe you've just been working too hard. Maybe whatever. There's so many different scenarios. But just try it. And so that's my point. Like, we have all these little rules, right? What if we stopped playing into them and we started living according to how we need to live? I recognize I need downtime. I'm going to allow myself to have downtime. You give yourself what you need and then you can go on and do what it is that you know you need to actually accomplish because we do have responsibilities. And I think as an adult, you don't mind the responsibilities. The responsibilities can actually be really rewarding and fun sometimes, like going to work and getting a paycheck or getting knowledge from your boss or um, you know whatever you choose to do, uh, maybe volunteering for something. Like as adults, we give ourselves responsibilities because you have to in to be a cooperating member of society. Um, but it feels really good to be able to like pay your bills and do all these things. And, um, but it feels really hard when we don't allow ourselves the things that we want. So, you know, again, going back to like the fitness industry, if you hate working out and you've decided that at 5 a.m. you're waking up every day and going into robot mode and working out, and then you're also a mom or a dad, and so then you have to go straight to work, you gotta deal with work all day, and then you gotta come home, and you gotta go to your kid's shit, and you gotta make dinner, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do that, and you go to bed, and then you wake up at 5 a.m. That's an exhausting lifestyle. And for anyone to tell you to initiate robot mode on that, fuck them. So how you need to figure that out You need to incorporate some sort of movement, some sort of lifestyle, something that you can actually handle, right? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Fuck them all. (laughs) Now we're getting into the book portion of the episode. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these books uh, and... I highly recommend reading them if you enjoy reading. Um, I'm sure some of them you could probably find on audio as well if you're more of a listener. Um, But if you're not into reading or any of that stuff, then um, just keep watching The Board Housewife and I'll fill you in (laughs) what you need. Um, Okay, so I can't pronounce this man's last name. This book I'm sure many of you have heard of. I've been wanting to read it for years. It's called The Alchemist by Paolo Colo. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Anyways, um, I'm not going to get into what the book is actually about. I'm just going to mention he has several books. Um, He is totally a modern day philosopher. I love how he writes because he writes his philosophy within a story form. So that is the point that I wanted to make. Um, not all philosophers are crotchety, old, uh, Greek philosophers or something century philosopher, um, that just write and sounds like they're talking in circles, trying to like prove their points, whatever. Um, like there are some philosophers who write in a story form. It is so much more digestible because it's in a relate, like in a setting that you can like, you know, get into in a relatable way. Um, and then, you know, see how you could apply that to your own life. So if you have not read The Alchemist, I highly recommend it. Um, it is a beautiful book. So now we have Plato. What I'm going to say about Plato is Plato was a student of Socrates. He wrote down Um, Socrates teachings so I'm sure you've heard of these two old farts Um, Socrates was uh, one of the first philosophers and he did not believe in writing anything down because he was fearful that if we started writing things down that there would not be any orators left people who told stories and he was correct so (laughs) um, that people's memories would go and man is that man not wise Um, So Plato took it upon himself as a student of Socrates to write down Socrates' stories. Also in story form. And today, you know, it's been edited and translated and interpreted. So, you know, they're really not that hard to understand. I think people feel really overwhelmed when they think about reading Plato. But um, 
<clears throat> so much of Socrates' teachings are still in play today, and that just tells you what kind of philosopher this person was because the fact that you can relate things to our modern day 21st century is just insane. So if you've not read any Plato and you're feeling a little out there, I really suggest it. It's really not that hard to read. Um, I think people think that it's like Aristotle is really hard to read. Plato is not hard to read. Okay. <clears throat> the next guy, I have two of his books here. Um, I have several others. It's Albert Camus. So this guy, people claim is an existentialist. He is more of an absurdist. And this is where I'm going to get back into the whole meaning of life shit. So an absurdist, um, and you can look this up. Uh, I'm still a little fuzzy on it because I thought Albert Camus was an existentialist for a really long time. Um, basically... Someone who is an absurdist um, believes in the absurd. <laughs> and the absurd is us as humans, okay, we are always searching for the meaning of life. And over here is the universe, the empty universe, and it says there are no meaning of life. So there's another philosopher called Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard. Like, I don't know, one of those two pronunciations. Um, he actually believed in a higher power. He believed in God. Um, I don't really think Albert Camus believed in God. Um, he called that a leap of faith because it makes you feel good. But he said that's not based in reality. Okay, a little too much philosophy there. So going back to my basic <laughs> uh, <laughs> telling of what's going on. So the absurd is when the person, the human, who is searching for this, this meaning of life, this purpose, intercepts with the actual non-meaning of life. And this is the absurd, their realization that there is no meaning in this world. Um, what do you do when that happens, right? Well, there's three options. Um, you could commit suicide, which is not a good option. Camus doesn't even think it's a good option um, because it doesn't do anything. Um, you're still just playing into the absurd. It's kind of like a game. It's like you're trying to defy the absurd even though you're not going to win it. Um, you're still trying to defy it. Killing yourself is not an answer ever to anything, but that is how some people might interpret their interaction with the absurd. There's the leap of faith, which we kind of just mentioned, um, which is believing in a higher power. Um, Camus didn't really think that. If you believe in a higher power, I believe in a higher power. Doesn't matter, right? We're just talking about his teachings. And the cool thing about philosophy is you can incorporate it into your life however you want. So you can enjoy Camus' books like I do and also believe in God. The third is accepting the absurd accepting the realization that there actually isn't a meaning in life and continuing in your life as if there is <laughs> okay <laughs> so that is a little bit of that i hope i didn't like get too heavy there um the cool thing about that right okay so my interpretation of Camus, and it has helped me greatly in my life, is this, again, the search for happiness. So how I was mentioning earlier, these people have found their purpose, right? So whether they believe that there is this bigger picture or there's nothing, I don't know what these people think, but here's the purpose, right? Um... When you think about it in the way of Camus and you realize that, or you, if you want to take this interpretation, that there is no purpose to life, um, none of this matters, which again, you kind of hear a lot on social media. It doesn't matter. None of this matters, whatever. Okay, but people say that and they still do things, right? It gives you freedom when you think that way. So... If you think to yourself, this doesn't matter, I am going to do it, whatever I want, freedom. Because you're no longer chained to these rules. You're no longer chained to what people think. Um, you're doing exactly whatever the hell you want to do 
despite the fact that nothing matters. <laughs> you guys with me? <laughs> so the more you play into it, the more you decide to be fine with that, to sit with that, whatever happens, happens. Nothing can surprise you anymore. Nothing can let you down. I mean, sure, if you're you're still going to be let down, you're still going to whatever because we're human beings and you can't always exist in this realm of absurdity. Um, but we try for it. You try to keep yourself. And one of the things that I love about Camus is that happiness is not actually those moments of euphoria that we feel. So you find out that your wife is pregnant and you've been trying really hard for a long time. Oh my God, what happiness, right? Um, that moment's fleeting. That moment doesn't exist forever. It certainly doesn't exist once you've had the baby and they're screaming at 3 a.m. in the morning and you want to just fucking sleep, right? You're like, we used to be so happy about this idea. <laughs> that's not, you know, that's not actually happy happiness. Those are just euphoric moments that feel really amazing, you know? Happiness is actually contentment where um, this is my scenario and I don't feel too high. I don't feel too low. I'm just kind of neutral right now. That's what we should all be aiming for, um, according to commit. So I'm not going to tell you what to aim for. I try to live my life by that. And to be honest, this is, again, what I'm saying about the self-help shit. Nothing in a self-help book has ever brought me any consolation as a philosophy book. After I read Camus and I read him say that, or and I read his you know teaching of that, again, also Camus is a storyteller. So he tells this in a story form. Um, I've never forgotten that. It has stayed with me since the day that I read it. And when I think about my life and when I think about what's going on and stuff isn't happening the way that I want it to, or, you know, stuff feels out of control, or maybe it's just like, oh my God, today is an amazing day. I take all of it with a grain of salt, and I take all of it as just another day that I'm alive, and I'm breathing, and I'm here to be able to do something. I'm here to be able to pursue something. I'm here to accept the absurd. Um, so that's what's cool about Camus. He's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really suggest that you look into him because, again, he's easy to digest, and um, I think his ideas are really interesting um, to just put things, put life in perspective, I guess. So then we have here The Art of Living. I'm going to talk about this in my next episode, so I'm not going to get too into it. I just want to point out again how long each chapter is. They're like just a few pages long. That's important because you don't need a bunch of stupid antidotes to be relatable. People will find relativity in their mind regardless of a dumb story that you told. So when you're trying to look for something to actually have impact and change on your life and to open your mind to think about something different, Look at how long the chapters are. Look at what they're actually saying. And then again, The War of Art. I love this book. I bought it for so many people. Um, the chapters are so short. It's so easy to get through. Um, and it sticks with you. There's just so many aspects of these books that I think back on. I think I actually, when I'm feeling certain ways, my brain goes straight there. I've read so many self-help books. I've read so many different things, and I can't fucking tell you anything about them other than robot mode. Robot mode, robot mode. Okay? These things actually have changed and impact on my life and have created the person that I am. They are the reason why I am able to live in northern Alabama for three years and still be married to my husband on recruiting duty. I am serious because... I don't, ha I've gone to another realm <laughs> in my mind of what my expectations should be. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for hanging in there with me this episode. I know it's a lot. I know it's heavy. Philosophy is not for everybody. Um, I remember the first day <laughs> that I was in my introduction. Um, I think it was like 
law ethics and politics or something. It was an introduction to philosophy class. I was obsessed from day one. I was like, I have found my people. (laughs) I think several people dropped the class because it just went over their head. Um, We all have special talents and gifts. We're all born with something else. I now feel today um, part of my purpose (laughs) but part of who I am is um for those of you who are listening on Apple or Spotify I use a bunch of quotation marks in the air (laughs) I just got done talking about how we have no purpose um anyways uh so the point is though my calling my special gift and talent I think is actually somewhat of a philosopher And I hope you guys don't think I'm just, like, tooting my own horn. I've never thought this ever in my entire life. I've never thought I was smart enough or intelligent um, or uh, wise or enough to be someone who would claim to be a philosopher. But I'm in this mode of life right now where I'm like, fuck it. I am 30 years old. I went to college and I have a minor in philosophy. And God damn it, I can talk about it if I want to. And I think part of that, and I have so many ideas and so many things that I want to share with people, if I want to call myself a fucking philosopher, I'm going to. (laughs) So, (laughs) anyways, um, the next episode is going to be a lot more precise. I, what I want to do is take a theme, and so, um... Like I said, I'm going to be working out of the Art of Living book for a little while. Um, And I think this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a book um, and I'm going to talk about it. But I'm going to make it relatable to our lives and to women and if men watch this. um, What sort of things that are going on and are important and just give you another perspective um, because that's all I want to do. I don't want to tell you guys how to live your life. I don't want to give you advice because that's stupid. Um, one of my favorite quotes ever is Socrates that says, all I know is that I know nothing. And I have said that since the day that I learned it, it has resonated with me and it stuck with me. Um, and I loved it so much because in all the things Socrates would say that, and then he'd go and like just fucking burn the person he was talking to um so it's kind of fun but anyways if you want to follow along with me um the book is the art of living it's the classical manual on virtue happiness and effectiveness um i do not know how to pronounce this person's name but i'm going to try this is a greek philosopher who wrote this and his name is epictetus 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 your guess is as good as mine. Um, the interpretation is by Sharon LaBelle. So, again, if you guys want to pick up this book, I highly recommend it because it's a beautiful way to, if you're looking for something to kind of give you, if you're looking for a self-help book, look at philosophy. Um, that's actually what's going to help. And that is my only opinion <laughs> that is stern, that could be you know, that is objective, that I'm not going to give otherwise. But yeah, philosophy is actually self-help because you look inward and you contemplate things. And I just don't think we have enough of it these days. I think that too many people are being told what to think and how to feel. And if we had more free thinkers, um, I think that we all would get along a lot better. Um, So... Again, The Art of Living, this is what I'm going to be talking about for the next few weeks. Um, So yeah. (laughs) You guys, thank you so much for holding on to this episode. I really hope that you thought it made sense. Um, Watch it again if you need to. I know I sound probably a little talking in circles and crazy, But the thing is, to get points across, sometimes you have to say them over and over again. Um, But yeah, this is going to be really fun. I will give you a preview because I'm going to tape this episode ahead of time. Um, Next week is going to be a 
thing out of the art of living and it's going to be I took a very very small passage and I am incorporating it into a life experience that I've been experiencing with my husband and friends um so and that's all the episode is going to be about and it's probably going to be much shorter um but yeah so anyways thank you guys so much um please like please subscribe please share um i had so much fun with you today uh lady eccentric will be back again next week and (laughs) so (laughs) you guys i'm pumped i am so fucking pumped i finally found it i just hope you guys like it too anyways all right cheers Have a great week, guys. Bye.